So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Church in Wenham. I hear it's the best church in town. It's also the only one. That's right. That's right. So I want to welcome you here this morning. And as you know, here at First Church, we have a wide open welcome. welcome. And I was thinking about, I have like little notes to remind me what to say. You hear it every week, right? So if this is your first time visiting us or first time in a long time, you're as welcome as the old regulars who we can always count on to sit in their pew. You're very welcome here. Who else do we welcome here? Everyone. Yeah, we welcome everyone, whether you were born near here or born miles from here or born somewhere across the globe. We welcome you here if you wear glasses or you have 20-20 vision. We welcome you here if you're gay or straight or somewhere in between. We welcome you here if you're married, if you're single, divorced, or maybe somewhere in between. We welcome you if you know the Bible by heart or you've never opened it. We welcome you if you have deep faith, if you're seeking, or if you're wondering and are confused. Really, the welcome is for all of you who have walked in the door, who have come to be together in the presence of God. Maybe even if all you want to do is sit and rest, because we're all walking on this path of life together. And so here is a place where you can feel that you belong, even if it's for just this Sunday. So we allow ourselves to be embraced by God's loving arms this morning. So I have a couple of announcements. One announcement is especially for you kids. You're staying up in worship today, and if that means that you'd like to do a little something while you're listening, there are activity bags in the back in the narthex. If you didn't know that, I just refilled them. So they have model magic in them. They all have um, crayons that most of them aren't broken. There's some markers. There was all kinds of things that if that's something you want to do. And sometimes people have said to me, well, why are you giving the kids something to do in worship? Shouldn't they pay attention? All right, I have, who has been to a women's group where the women are clickety-clacking with the um, knitting needles and some of the men, and they're listening to everything. So this is the same thing. It's their knitting bag. So if you need that, and maybe adults, maybe you would like to draw while you're listening. Feel free. Um, also, next week is New Member Sunday. So anyone who is interested in becoming a member should be talking to me or to Mike. Um, it's also the last day of church school. And then the following week, June 10th, will be our Teacher Appreciation Sunday. And I think there's also, if you look at the back of your bulletin, there's also a, um, a concert in the afternoon. And, and I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. Quartet fin de siècle? Fin de siècle. Okay. End of the century. Yep. Seven years of French. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And I didn't, no one has come to see me about announcements. We're sort of moving into the, there's like the last hurrah of the church year, and then we get sleepy. And today is kind of like a sleepy day. It's a preview for the summer. And I'm actually so pleased to see so many of you here, because what I was going to tell you is you are the remnant. You are the holy and sacred remnant of worship here, holding the space for all of your sisters and brothers who are somewhere else today wherever they may be, and we can hold them in prayer and hold ourselves in prayer and be happy to be here together. So I'm going to invite you now to put down your bulletins, to put down the things that are on your minds and that you're worrying about, and realize that you have made a choice to come here, to be in worship together. So this is your time to let go. You have nowhere else to be but here. And as Joe sounds the, sounds the chimes, take three deep breaths with a slow and long exhale as we prepare ourselves for worship.
morning. May I ask everyone who is able to please stand and join me with the call to worship? Sing of love's glory and strength. Love's voice is upon the waters and echoes over the ocean and sea. The voice of love breaks the bonds of oppression, shatters the chains of injustice. Love invites all to the dance of freedom, to sing a beloved song of truth. The voice of love strikes with fire upon hearts of stone. Love uproots the thorns of fear. The beloved lives in our hearts. Love dwells with us forever. May love give strength to all people and bless all nations with peace. <clears throat> Please join me in this morning's invocation and the Lord's Prayer. God of delight, your wisdom sings for our very needs, your loving spirit. You welcome us into your joyful dance where you know and are known in every beginning, in all sustaining acts and healing moments, in every redemption. May we live your divine unity and the diverse ministries you entrust to us, offering hope that does not disappoint, reflecting love that endures. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our present, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen.
I want to invite you now into a time of prayer where I'm speaking the words, but you also are praying. You're not simply listening, but what, what I'm going to invite you to do now is to turn your attention inward where God's spirit touches your own spirit. So may God be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we breathe in your spirit of peace and we breathe out resentment, anger, and fear. We breathe in your spirit, asking, inviting that you fill us with your light, with your love that releases us, releases us from old grudges and hurts and recent slights, your love that gives us new eyes to see and ears to hear, with forgiveness, understanding, and peacemaking. And God, we bring with us today many people and situations that are on our hearts and on our minds. And we who are in the congregation lift up those names and situations to you aloud and in silence. Bill, Lois, Carly, Susie. And we lift up these names of those who are in our church family and our friends. And we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit be with them. Be with them in their needs and in their celebrations. Be with them in their grief and struggling and in their joy and thanksgiving. And we lift up Florence LeClaire, Fred Hale, Marty Doggett, Heidi Yushikoff, Dick Gordeaux, Jean LaBelle, Will, Betty, Carol Stewart, Steve Marcella, Dottie Jones, Maya and Tola, Doris Bain, Brad Stanley, Kristen Abernathy, Judy, Skip and Barbara, Joyce Wagner, Belva Wilton, Jane Harwood, Terry Aramo's mom, Audrey, Julie Stevens, Kit Taylor, David Perry, Steve Homer, Baby Libby, Tucker, Bob Arkan, David Perry, Colin, Carolyn Holland, and Barbara Henderson and her family on the recent death of her grandson, Harry. And God, we ask your blessing upon them and their friends as they gather together here Tuesday at 1 o'clock for a funeral. And God, we are mindful that tomorrow is Memorial Day, a day that's set apart by our nation to remember those who have given their lives for us who are here, given their lives to uphold the values that we all hold dear in this country of freedom and understanding and peace. So today we pray for all of those who have given their lives serving in our military, and we pray also for their loved ones left behind. We also pray for soldiers of other nations who have also given their lives. We pray for civilian victims of war and militarism. 
And God, we also pray for those who have sacrificed for the sake of peace, for the sake of nonviolence that we learn from Jesus. We pray for conscientious objectors and protesters who have given their lives for the sake of healing. God, give us courage. Give us compassion to devote ourselves to nonviolence, healing, and reconciliation. For what could be a better tribute to those who have given their lives, God, than to work for peace? And we do so in the name and the spirit of Christ who met violence with love. Christ, the gentle one, the crucified one, and the risen one, in whose name we pray. Amen. This spring has been a funny spring, kind of cool and March-like for three months, when suddenly one morning it feels like we woke up and everything was green. My grass is green. My dogwood tree is actually blooming. And then the last couple of days felt like the middle of the summer. And my daughter and I thought, we better hurry up and get some flowers in the ground. So yesterday we were putting all the flowers in the ground. And they looked really pretty, and we watered them. And then off she went with a friend, and, and she went home. And this morning I woke up, and it was 50-something degrees outside and gray again. I thought, oh, I've slept for like six months. <laughs> but then I walked downstairs, and I looked out the kitchen window, and there were all these flowers, the snapdragon and the dahlias. And um, what other do we have? Oh, we have something called cat mint, Persian blue cat mint. It was just beautiful. So I just want to invite you to notice the beauty that's around us. This spring, it just seems more colorful, more lush than it has in the years past. And for that, I know we're all really, really grateful. And it's from that 
gratitude, that place of thankfulness in our hearts, that we offer what we can to support the ministry of the church. So would the ushers come forward and, and uh, receive the offering? Holy God, what an amazing world you have given us. May we look at these changing seasons as if it's the first time, because that's what it feels like. May we see the beauty that surrounds us. May we breathe it in so that we too can be part of the beauty of your creation, inside and out. We offer these our gifts with gratitude and hope that your Holy Spirit transform them into the living ministries of this church, serving both the people in this faith community and all beyond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today's reading comes from the Gospel according to John. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 863. As you may recall, the Gospel of John is significantly different than the other three Gospels 
It has characters and events not found in the other Gospels and uses symbolic language with subtle meanings. Irony and paradox are common in John, as are long, hard to, as are long, hard to understand discourses by Jesus. Something to remember is that this gospel comes from a time in which the Jewish Christians were separating from the Jewish synagogue community. John refers to the Jews in a way that seems to suggest a whole people. But we must remember that this is meant to be, a relig meant to be the religious leaders. Today's reading follows Jesus cleansing the temple of the money changers, followed by many signs that brought the people to believe in Jesus and follow. Hear now the reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicol Nic Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born having grown old? No one can enter a second time into a woman's, from a woman's womb and be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished what I said to you. You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be true? Your ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that you bless the words from my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, that through that, through them, we will hear your voice of love loud and clear. Amen. Long before there were cell phones and FaceTime and caller ID, we typically answered the phone with the greeting, hello, and with the question, who's calling? Well, this old-fashioned question is making a re-emergence now because all of those phone solicitors have cleverly figured out a way to mask who they are. I don't know if you've noticed this, you probably have. So what shows up on your caller ID is often a familiar number or even a name. And you think, ah, I'll pick it up, because I know who it is who's calling. Now I recently had one of my caller IDs come up and it said the Topsfield Police Department. I figured I better pick that up. What is it? I thought there was something bad happening pick it up, and something bad was happening. I heard a caller, the voice, talking really rapidly, and what she was saying was, I got a deal for you on carpet cleaning. Carpet cleaning? I thought that would get a laugh. Isn't that funny? All right, anyway, all right. That's why I'm not a stand-up comic and I'm a preacher. But, you know, I tried to interrupt her and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, but there was no response. She just kept talking, and that's when I realized, oh... She's not a real person. You know those disembodied voices you hear on the phone, they also called robocalls? They defy the questions we try to ask, like who's calling, or stop calling me, or take me off your list, and happily go through blah, 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 telling you about whatever it is. And we realize there's really, there's a voice, but there's nobody there. And so you're left holding the phone, feeling silly for asking and trying to talk. 
to a disembodied voice. Now, those voices we hear are annoying and confusing, and then they join in with all of those other voices that are constantly vying for our attention. And I'd say more so now than even 20 years ago. Lots and lots of voices. And so we wonder, how do we navigate all that noise to find, figure out which part should we listen to? What should we listen to? How do we even listen to that and get rid of everything else? Now, when I was a kid and I had a question, a good place to find answers was cartoons. OK? Cartoons. My mother, who has passed away many years ago, would be very disappointed with me that I was saying, look for, for answers in cartoons. But if you remember back when you were little, when Saturday morning was a big deal because that was cartoon time, right? And often there were cartoons with a story, with a character who had a dilemma. Let's call him Joe. So Joe, our cartoon character, has this dilemma. And he has to mull over his cartoon problem. And suddenly, on his shoulder appears a very small version of Joe. Looks just like him, but he's dressed with a halo and a robe. And I'm maybe even a harp. And begins to whisper in his ear. Now what he whispers is, this is the good thing you should do. And explains why it's a good thing and why you should do it. And Joe kind of is like leaning, like, OK. And who is to appear on this, this side? But another little mini version of Joe, this time holding a pitchfork with a tail, red, talking into his other ear, poking fun at what this one was saying. Say, I got a better idea for you. This will be much better for you. And what he lays out is so tempting and irresistible. Yes, Joe follows the bad advice that comes from the bad voice. And of course, what happens is something hilarious and, and ridiculous, and we all laugh. And then the angel's kind of shaking his head, like, ah, humans, you know, what are we going to do with the humans? But there really is a lesson in the silliness of the angel here and the devil here. The good advice, the bad advice. The lesson is, you need to know who has your ear. Who is it that's talking to you? And then the other advice is choose the good advice. Pretty simplistic and even silly in the way it's conveyed in a cartoon. Yeah, it is. But I'm going to have you think about this one. Those cartoons' simple options of good and bad really echo John's gospel. John's gospel does something similar. It is different than the others. We have fancier language than in the cartoons. For John's Gospel, we would say there's dualistic imagery and symbolism to clarify the way of Jesus, which way we should go. But it's kind of like that cartoon of the good angel and the bad devil whispering into Joe's ear. What John's Gospel does is it sets apart the people who do the evil thing, listening to the bad voice, and they tend to stay in the darkness because they don't want to be seen. They know the thing they're doing isn't a good thing. And so John separates them from the people that do good things, that listen to that good voice. And those people are drawn to the light. And the light reveals God at work in what that person is doing. Sorry, I lost my place. I got so excited about my cartoon images. But I never thought about the cartoon reflecting um, John's gospel. But this whole idea of darkness and light that makes it seem like it's this or it's this. So when Nicodemus comes, he comes at night. It's important to remember. It's, it's really the most important part, I think, of the story. He comes at night under the cover of darkness. And he goes to see Jesus. And in his greeting, if you remember what was said, he says, I know that you have come from God, for no one can do the signs you did 
without the presence of God. So you start to recognize there's a little shift going on from in the darkness, moving towards the light, coming to Jesus and acknowledging who he is. And I think that Nicodemus is truly curious, really wondering about who is this guy, Jesus? And he's wondering, should I listen to him? He's coming to Jesus almost like asking, who's calling? Who are you? And should I be listening to you? Well, the conversation turns into an unexpected back and forth over being born from above and being born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus like, what? I don't get it. What are you talking about? And that they just seem to be doing this. And Nicodemus gives away his lack of understanding when he just says, how can these things be? It almost is like he's saying, this is ridiculous. What are you talking about being born from above and wind coming and going? What? I need to know who you are. Now, our reading ends there. But what goes on is one of those long discourses of Jesus that's a little hard to understand. But basically, what he's saying is, the people who come to the light follow me, and I come from God. There's a dilemma, though. There is a dilemma that Jesus sets out before Nicodemus in the words that follow. Not unlike the dilemma that Joe, the cartoon character, had to see. He's got to make a choice. There's a good choice and there's a bad choice. And Jesus paints this picture of the dilemma that faces religious leaders like Nicodemus. Who will you listen to? Will you listen to the customs that you've been following? Or will you listen to Jesus? And the choices, again, are given light and dark. And like the cartoon, those who act with bad intentions remain in the dark. But those who are drawn to the light reveal God at work. And Jesus really seems to be encouraging Nicodemus, who comes to him to figure out what is going on. Now, the religious le other religious leaders are not happy with Jesus. In particular, he just knocked over all the money changers in the temple, and they were not happy with that. But Nicodemus recognized something, and he reached out. And if he reached out to Jesus, he answers. He's trying to encourage Nicodemus. And if you continue reading the Gospel of John, you'll see something happens to Nicodemus because he speaks up in a meeting of the, of the elders later on and says something in favor of Jesus. And then at the end, when Jesus has, has been crucified, he goes to, uh, with the oils and ointments to anoint Jesus' body. So something really important does happen to him that night. So the guidance is pick the good voice. So you can go home, right? And that's all, you're all set, pick the good voice. It's a simple thing. Choose to walk in the light and do what is good. But to live that way is not easy. It's one of the reasons we have a church. We come to encourage one another, support one another, and keep each other accountable so that you can't come and say, I know how to follow Jesus. It's with these snakes. We're going to do snake charming. Nah, I don't think that's the way. That's the kind of thing. But whenever you meet someone whose life seems like that, like walking in the light, you treasure that story. And I have one of those stories. And it came to me in the life of Bill. Bill was a congregant of mine in one of my first churches I served. And he joined the Navy when he was 18 during World War II. Now Bill is a kind and faithful man with a twinkling smile that my daughter says, I want to have wrinkles like his because they show their smile wrinkles. Just a lovely, lovely man. But he told me when he first shipped out, he can clearly remember standing alone on the deck of the ship, scared to death, trembling. And what he did was he sang hymns to settle his nerves. Now, as the war was nearing its end, Bill's ship picked up some German U-boat survivors. And they held them as POWs on the ship until they could bring them um, somewhere else. 
Now, Bill had security clearance, and he had access to these POWs. So he decided to go and find out who they were and find out their names and where they were from and whether they had a family. So through broken English and German, they were able to understand one another. And Bill listened. He listened deeply. And in that moment, he noticed something and realized something incredibly important in his life. He realized that these enemies were an awful lot like him. They loved their country like he loved his country. They were willing to fight for their country and to fight for their family who they loved, who were at home. Decades later, Bill contacted the German consulate. And by some amazing feat, he still had a little piece of paper from the 1940s that had the names of these POWs and their addresses at the time. So he had the consulate find out, would any of them be willing to allow me to contact them? I'd like to you know, see how things are going. And only one agreed, Jan. Jan said, I'd love to hear from him. So they began exchanging letters and then phone calls and then visits. And to me, what's, what's so wonderful is Jan came to one of um, Bill's Navy reunions, the German POW at this reunion. And he was welcomed by everyone. So Jan and Bill's friendship deepened and expanded over the ensuing years, creating a multi-generational family of friendship that eventually included my family. I think Bill and Jan's story is amazing. To me, it's what Christ is all about, the reconcil reconciling power of Christ. Because out of this common experience of being enemies, it was that reconciliation where they became friends. And I've often wondered, what was it that brought Bill to go down and talk to the POWs? And why did he try to reconnect with them decades later? I think it had to do with Bill listening. He was listening to them. He was listening to his own heart. He's just a kind, kind man. His kind heart led him to talk to those frightened POWs because he remembered how frightened he was when he got on that ship. And he understood their fear. And he sought to comfort them in their time of need and found it comforted him as well. And what he discovered in that moment when he talked to them on the ship was their shared humanity. Bill was clear on who was calling him, calling him to act then and then again decades later. It was the voice of love. It was who we call God. It takes practice to separate through all of the voices that are vying for our attention, talking to us in one ear, in another ear. So we listen with our hearts. We listen with our heart of experience for the voice of love. Bill heard it on the Navy ship. Nicodemus was changed by it that night with Jesus. Now for you and for me, we practice. We practice it by listening to each other with curiosity, with understanding, and with respect. We listen for the voice of love that calls us out of our complacency, the voice of love that calls us out into the world, into our country that is so divided now by fear and suspicion. We're called out with courage and with a heart full of love to seek out those others that we need to listen to. And then through that, we discover together our shared humanity. Amen.
May God open your hearts. Open your hearts to God's love that dwells within and among us. Open you to believe how fully you are welcomed each moment of your life by God. May God open you to carry your union with God to those who are part of your daily encounter. May you be open even when you are re weary and resist or forget and doubt and are angry, anxious. Open your hearts to full confidence, to the trust that you have, that there is more than enough love to give away. May God open, open you to the journey of love that is yours. Amen. Thank you. 